Thank you, boys. Everybody good? It's good to see you. My name is Mark. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with codependency. And um, man, if this is your very first night here, thanks so much for coming. I hope you come back next week. I hope you'll uh, check out a group like Lori was saying tonight. You know, take the time to check out a group. If you want to know what group will be best for you, we'd love to talk to you about that after worship tonight. Or um, you can go to the orientation group right over here and uh, we can work, work, you, work our way through with you all the groups that we um, have put together here and all the fellowship opportunities. But I know, um, I know that's a very big deal in the, um, you know, in the walk toward freedom. I know it's a very big deal. And I know for everyone in here that um, has that freedom, you know, they will tell you that, that those groups you know, and meetings were a big, a big step. A big step, a step they probably didn't want to take if they're honest, you know, but a big step. We're going to talk about honesty tonight, and um, we're starting this new series, Six Keys to Sober Living, which I think is going to be good stuff for all of us, and I uh, want to welcome uh, all of our locations tonight. I want to welcome everybody who's joining us online, and i um, grateful that you're with us, grateful that uh, those guys of you that are in other locations are providing recovery in your cities. And uh, thank you for the effort and for the work, you know, and I know you see good, you see some good days and you see some days that are really hard, just like we do here. And uh, I'm grateful that you keep putting one foot in, the, in front of the other in those hard days. So let's pray. Sweet Jesus, I do want to pray for our locations. And um, I thank you for the way that you sustain them and for the light that you bring to people's lives through them. God, I thank you for this, this space here tonight and just pray that your spirit is just everywhere in this room and that you'll teach us about ourselves in a way that we would not know and uh, that you'll open us up, that you'll, that you'll open our hearts tonight, God, that you'll, you'll break our hearts if you need to, to be able to get inside of the inside of the inside, which is where... Um, you know, which is where we need to be led and where we need to be healed. In your sweet name, amen. So lots of times I think that uh, the conversation about recovery is sort of, um, it's kind of narrow, and the conversation gets narrowed down to, you know, the, all the don't do's. You know, like that's an uh, attractive, easy way to, to talk about recovery is that, you know, well, it's really about not using something, not doing something, not thinking a certain way, not functioning in a certain way, not behaving in a certain way, and that's sort of like a shortcut to the conversation, and I don't see, um, I see plenty of evidence when God talks to people about what I was just praying about, their broken hearts. I see plenty of evidence where God is talking to people about the inside of the inside of the inside in their life. I see lots of talking that God is doing with people about, you know, what it is that they're most afraid of and what the darkest place in their life is really all about. You know, and I see God consistently wanting to go to people's hearts, and, and that really has everything to do with what we're going to talk about with this conversation about honesty tonight. Here's what I know. The level at which you're willing to be loved is, and I think especially by God, but the level at which you're willing to be loved is directly connected to the level at which you're willing to be honest. Do you guys believe that? The level at which you're willing to let yourself be loved is the level at which you're willing to let yourself be honest, you know? And I think back like what it was like in, at, I mean, I can go back and think about like what it was like at, you know, three, four, five years old or whatever. And I think about the times when I knew that something had gone wrong, you know, that I had done something out of whack. I knew that my, that some sibling, because being one of six, you know, if you're from a big family, you know how this is, right? Somebody's always in line to rat you out, amen? Like, you always got a sibling ready to rat you out because how much fun is that? You know, like, that's one of the best things about being in a big family is somebody always, 
is up there to take the shot, you know? So, you know, that I knew. And I mean, I knew that, so I knew that. I didn't really know a lot of what I did not know was I did not know that usually my parents already knew, you know, far more than I thought they did about the event and about what happened. But I did know enough to eventually go to them and say, look, this is what happened, this is what I did, this is where I was wrong, you know, blah, 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 and talk about it, being honest. But see, as time rolled along, what I learned was the way that my parents felt about me didn't change. The way that uh, my siblings were gonna continue to rat me out, that didn't change. But what did change was I began to realize that I mean, it wasn't legit, but I began to realize that the way I could manage and control uh, events could bring me to a place of, of opportunity for what I thought was power, meaning knowledge is power, and so the absence of knowledge is the absence of power, and so if I know something that my parents don't know, and I'm not sharing it, well then, you know what? The absence of power that my parents have makes me feel that much better about me. And so I learned along the way in adolescence that, you know, that was a nice little, that was a nice little trick. Most people that are 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 23, whatever, pretty good at that. Pretty good at that. When my dad got killed, I learned to play that out with God. Because I became convinced that God couldn't love me and allow my dad to die in a car wreck. God couldn't love me the way at least I wanted to be loved and leave six children without a dad. He just couldn't do that. And so my mind became a uh, went to such a place where I believed that, you know what, God, you know, God, number one, God really wasn't safe. Number two, God didn't really love me. And number three, I wasn't gonna share with God how I really felt because I no longer trusted him and I was no longer convinced that he loved me. And see, when I got to that place with God, I began to watch myself, you know, lose interest in, you know, going to worship. I began to watch myself lose interest in uh, people talking about God to me much. I began to like pull away from relationships that I had been in a while, you know, in my life. I began to spend more time just with some people that were more, um, I guess, cynical and uh, more interested in doing what they wanted to do, when they wanted to do it, how they wanted to do it. And uh, I became much more uh, adept, much better at turning a phrase in such a way to avoid telling most anybody the truth about most anything. And I mean, relationships are gonna suffer because relationships, healthy relationships are built on what? They're built on trust. You know, when you, when you don't have trust, the relationship's gonna begin to suffer. The problem with compulsion and addiction is, what does it create in us? Well, for one, I don't care what your compulsion is, it creates a desire and a belief that the way through what you're going through with everybody else in your life is the lie, amen? That's the way to do it because it helps us to continue what it is that we're in the middle of. And so we become very good at doing the opposite of being honest. We become very good at believing that truth, you know, that truth, the avoidance of truth is power, that truth represents danger, that honesty represents the threat to what I'm currently doing, and it's gonna cause me to have people down on me, it's gonna cause people to want me to quit what I'm doing, it's gonna cause people to challenge me, it's gonna cause me more pain because now I'm used to avoiding the pain in my life by whatever it is that I'm accommodating that pain with. And so I become convinced that honesty is not a, uh, it's not a practice that I wanna be involved in. 
when I was, you know, and I, I myself, I mean, I carried that perspective along for a while, and I paid in a lot of relationships. I paid um, in relationships with um, not so much family members because, you know, we were all kind of in the same grief together. Definitely friends, definitely relationships that were like, you know, dating relationships, definitely that. If you're in the middle of a compulsion or if you're in active addiction right now or if you remember what it was like when you were in active addiction, I've never met anybody who has said to me, you know what? I mean, when I was an active alcoholic, my marriage was the best it's ever been. You know what? When I was in active addiction, I'll tell you what, man, I was the best at work I have ever been. My finances were the best they've ever been. When I was in the middle of my pornography addiction, I was so focused on work, I was the star of the show for those five years. No one's ever said that to me. People are talking to me about exactly what it talks about in the big book. The wreckage and the destruction of the focus of the broken heart, amen? The wreckage and the destruction that compulsion and compulsive living causes. And it all goes back to that equation. The more I'm willing to accept love, the more I'm going to be willing to be honest. And the more I'm going to be willing to be honest, the more I'm really free. And I mean, it can go a lot of places. You know, I, I, remember, I remember not trusting people to really hear my feelings about the grief that I felt over losing my dad. And so I learned that people say, well, how, you know, how are you really doing? I mean, they generally wanted to know. But I didn't want them to know. And so I would say, well, you know, we're, we're getting along. I mean, I remember saying that to people on a regular basis at this church we were going to at the time, which I stopped going to, but we were going to at the time, the first Christmas after my dad's accident, right? And people would come up, well, how y'all, how y'all doing? What I should have said is, we are having the worst Christmas I've ever had in my whole life. What I should have said is, I don't want to continue to have Christmas. What I should have said is, I want to go home and take the tree and all the rest of the junk that we tried to put up to make it seem like it was okay. I want to take it all down, put it in boxes, and I don't even want to have Christmas this year. Or for that matter, as far as I can see, any other. That's what I should have said if I was going to be honest. But I smiled because I didn't trust those people at church. And I said, well, you know, we're, I mean, we're making it. We're making it. And then when it was God, I mean, God and I, like my prayer life just did when I stopped praying. I stopped praying because I just got tired of trying to think up stuff that would seem okay to talk to God about and that was really something I could live with in myself. Do you know what I mean? Something that I could actually pray about that was actually some part of me that was legitimate. And so I don't I mean, I just literally stopped praying. I stopped praying for years and years and years because, see, I decided that, you know, God couldn't love me if he could allow something like that in, in, in my life to happen. And see, I, as we've talked about a lot in these rooms, you know, like I definitely was connecting circumstances to the way that God loved me. You know, what helps us avoid honesty? Well, I mean, some of, the, some, some of these aren't new for any of us. I mean, we're all pretty good in active addiction and active compulsion. We're pretty good at blaming, amen? We really know how to blame other people. We know how to tell people that, well, you know what? If you didn't act like this today, if I didn't have this going on at work, if I didn't have this going on, if, if the traffic wasn't like this or this wasn't like this or money or whatever, 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 you know what? I, wouldn't, I really wouldn't be getting high. But because you are such a nag, because you are such a a horrible husband, because you are such a horrible wife, because you're such a horrible parent, because you're such a horrible boss. You know what? You leave me no choice but to try to figure out some way to make myself 
feel better. We, we're good rationalizers. You know, and our rationalization takes us to the phrase, it's really not that bad. You think it's that bad, but I don't think it's that bad. Because if I thought it was what you thought it was, I might have to sit and actually listen to what you're saying to me. It's much easier for me to go, she's just being judgmental. He's just being He's just being aggressively judgmental. I mean, he used to be, tell me if this isn't true. He used to be my friend, but now he's just meddling in my business, amen? Now he's just getting in the middle of my business. I thought we used to be buds, but now we're not because he sat there and had tried to have this talk with me and he came up with this word I've never heard my friend say, right? And my friend said, well, you know what, Mark? I mean, I'm... I'm concerned about you. <laughs> when you're on the no recovery side of addiction, I got to tell you, nothing made me more angry than to have some joker who didn't understand what was happening to me come up with a smart guy statement of wool. I mean, I'm concerned about you. People, someone said to me after my dad was, had, had, had been dead about a year, some friend of mine said, you know what, I, I mean, I thought, I mean, I, it's been a year. I mean, I, I thought, I thought you'd snap, I thought you'd snap back by now. It's our senior year. We're, we should be out having some fun. I thought you'd, you'd snap back by now. You know, my rationalization was, you know, uh, I don't even know, I wouldn't even know how to, how to snap back. And so my, my rationalization was since nobody understands, I'll just casually move myself farther and farther and farther into my own isolation, into being with myself. I'll hang around people, you know, I'll have, rela- I mean, I'll act like I'm in relationships, but you know what, I'm investing in none of them and I'm hanging out with myself more and more and more Def, definitely God is nowhere to be found because I've decided that somehow only I, only I really understand me. That's true because when we're unwilling to be honest, we hold all the cards, don't we? It's like sitting there playing poker. You know, if you're sitting there playing poker and I'm sitting there playing poker, like unless you got some kind of mirror or some kind of deal like that, you know, only I know what my cards are. And so what I say to you is, you know what? Nobody in this room understands. Nobody in this room really understands why I drink the way that I do. Nobody really understands why I use um, these pain meds the way I do. Nobody really understands the way I feel in my body. Nobody really understands how sad I am. And when I was taking Xanax, you know, they told me to take two a day, but see, five was better. Nobody really understands how lonely I am. Nobody really understands that, that more often than not, a week doesn't go by and I think about what would it be like if, you know, I just wasn't here. Because see, I'm not telling anybody about that kind of desperation. I'm holding all my cards right here. And see, when I have my hand cupped over my heart and I'm the only one holding it, and it's crumbling in front of me, that is a dangerous place to be. See, Jesus, if you, if you begin to allow Jesus into your heart, he's a master at open heart surgery. It doesn't matter how damaged your heart is. It doesn't matter how wrecked it is. It doesn't matter how much dysfunction it has. It doesn't matter what its medical or emotional history was. See, Jesus He says, I will give you a new heart. But you gotta be willing to share with me. Because if you close me out, the only person you're ultimately available to then is the enemy. See, we also use fear. You know, we're afraid of what people are gonna think if we tell them how we really feel. 
We're afraid of what people are, are gonna think of us. We're afraid that people are gonna think less of us. Parents normally go through the hell of dealing with a child who's struggling with addiction all by themselves. You know why? Because as parents, we don't want other parents to think that we're irresponsible or to think less of us. And let me just tell you something. If you're a parent and you have an adolescent child, never stop, never quit offering to your child the truth of how much Jesus loves them. And secondly, please don't keep the challenges you're facing a secret. Please involve us, involve other parents, involve other people who love you and extend the family and the fellowship for the strength. You know, there one of the things that happens with family members, I really do believe, is, is like we overfunction for, you know, we overfunction for our husbands and wives and children and all that because we have this view. We have this view of what duty really looks like in a relationship. And we believe that, I mean, if I've heard this once, I've heard it 200,000 times. Someone comes to me, what am I supposed to do with my son or daughter? You know, they don't work anymore. All they're doing is getting high every day. They, they, don't have, they don't have any desire to get better. I think they're gonna die. I say, you know what? Based on this disease, that's possible. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna help them die? Or are you gonna get out of the way and see what God is gonna do with them when it's just them and God and you're not providing any kind of a crutch? See, like for most of us as family members, we have a second agenda that we're running that we probably aren't even aware of. In my case, trying to protect my first wife from her disease, that came from believing that somehow, if I would have tried harder, worked harder, done something, known something, which I couldn't have known, but if I would have, that somehow maybe I could have saved my dad from his car accident. And so I began to live in my life believing that I was not gonna let that happen to anybody else ever again. I was gonna go to the mat to make sure the people in my life were okay. And man, I became really good at that. While I was making her, I think, even sicker. And see, as family members, we have to know, like, what is it about us? If, if I've been in a, if, if I have a son or a daughter and I've gone through a divorce, and that son or daughter is struggling with one thing or another, one compulsion or another. What is really driving me? What's driving me is I believe that somehow as a father or as a mother, I let my child down by going through that divorce. And when I did that, now I'm gonna super accommodate that failure that I feel I have. And I'm gonna overextend myself into that son or daughter's life, amen? I feel like maybe I haven't done the best job as a husband or as a wife, and so now I'm gonna super extend myself into their disease, and I'm gonna do everything I can to live just like they are, which is I'm gonna help them avoid honesty by helping myself avoid honesty. Honesty, what am I gonna do with my son? I mean, man, if he doesn't live with us, I mean, he's already stolen from us. He's already done, broken into our house. He's taken stuff out of my car. He's lied to me a hundred million times. He keeps relapsing. What am I gonna do with my son? Well, you're gonna let your son live someplace else and come to terms with his powerlessness. What happens? I mean, I can't do that. I feel deficient as a mom. I feel defective as a dad. He might end up down at the Knoxville area your rescue mission. He might. He might. But the honesty is, you didn't put him there. He did. You didn't put her there. She did. What you had to deal with, what I had to deal with, is the stuff that's rumbling around in us that we're not letting God get a hold of that gets us to a place of being so tumbled up that we're no longer sure what the truth is. Lots of family members can be very honest 
about the person who's the addict or the alcoholic, amen? They can be really good at diagnosing what the alcoholic is doing and not. Well, you know, he's, he's a sad case. He doesn't have any gumption. He doesn't really want to get better. I don't think he's going to ever be better. I don't know. I don't think he really wants to get sober. We're great diagnosticians. And then someone, then you start to stumble into Al-Anon. And someone goes, okay, tonight... We're going to have honest sharing about ourselves, and we're not going to talk about the alcoholic. Man, I don't know about you guys that have been to Al-Anon, and you're the family member. Not one thing has ever made me more angry than going through that first 200,000, it felt like, meetings here and that. It's like, are you kidding? I'm going to this stupid meeting to complain about her. I'm going to this meeting to talk about her addiction. That was the whole fun of it. And people are like, well, no, I think we should be talking about you. I'm like, me? They're like, son, you are as sick as she is. I'm like, nah. Nah, I'm here to help her, man. Don't you get it? See, that's us as family members. You know, we, we shake our head and we talk about the awful of the awful and we're still just as broken. Our hearts are just as hidden. And we're just as unwilling to talk to other people about the truth. See, that's a, a false, you know, that's that false honesty is we know the words, but we don't know anything about the heart. We know that we talked that about the other week. We know the words of recovery. We know the language. We know the phrases. We know the systems. We know what the big book says. We got it all. We know all that, but we don't know it in our heart. So false honesty. The big book says it like this. Those people who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves, which I did not, to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. They are such, their word, unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances of recovery are less than average. That's the big book, chapter five. See, here's the thing. In order for me to live freely, the death of my false self tonight is necessary. Like this thing of getting baptized. You get baptized because the you that is you as you know yourself tonight goes into that water and that you that you know that is you is drowned tonight in that water. And you're raised up in the waters from the waters of death. You're raised up in that same water. It becomes the water of life in Jesus and you're raised up with a new heart and a new freedom. But the death of my false self is gonna be necessary. There's a tool called the Jahari window that's just worth looking at and says this. You know, first of all, to look at the truth, I gotta look at the arena. What do I know about myself and what do other people know about me? Well, I know my name is Mark Beebe. You know my name is Mark Beebe. That would be an example of that. Facade. What you know about yourself, this is a favorite of those of us that are compulsives and addicts and alcoholics, right? The facade is what I know about myself and what others don't know, and they don't know it because I'm not gonna tell them. Blind spot. This is the part you hate. This is the part of this window you hate. What others know about you, but you don't know. What others know about you, but you don't know. I had a guy that came to my church. I'd never, I really had never met him before. So was when I was in Hilton Head, and the guy came up to me and he said, "Man, you're you know you're you're pretty good at this. You're pretty good at this." I'm like, well, thank you. I hope you come back. He goes, he goes, I'm going to come back, but I'm going to start praying for you. I'm like, Phew, what are you going? to, I'm like, about. He goes, well, 
He goes, I don't even know you, but you're really angry. You are really angry. And all your anger shows up um, in what you're trying to preach. And he goes, uh, man, I know, you, I, know that, I know that you have been around the love of Jesus in your life, but I, I, it's just, it's just lo- you, you're lost. <laughs> I bit my lip that morning. I'm like, I hope that clown never comes back to this church. Do you know he came back for months at a time and finally told me I'm moving up back to Pennsylvania somewhere. I'm like, oh, so sad, you know, but <laughs> man, unknown, what you know about what you and others don't know about you, stuff you just don't know and don't see. And then another guy I was reading some stuff about this week. He says it like this. I'd like to add a fifth one. The known unknown, or in other words, what you know about you, but you don't want to know. Anybody got some of that going on? What you know about you, but you don't want to know. It's really, really difficult to confront the truth about yourself because we all have some ugliness inside. And it's unbearably painful to see the selfishness and emptiness which we all work so hard to desperately cover, J.S. Park. It's hard to give so much trust to another person who can dig into your heart with a scalpel and reveal that there are real problems inside. Usually those kind of people we don't like. The level of surrender in my life and yours is gonna determine the level of honesty. You know, the way I'm loved is going to determine the way I'm honest, and the level at which I'm willing to surrender is going to determine the level of honesty. I think that the starting point for hearing criticism for me, same guy, is to know that I am both fully flawed and fully beloved. As a Christian, now get this, as a Christian, I believe that God has made known to me that I am woefully more messed up than I could possibly fathom, yet ultimately more loved, even though God knows that about me tonight, more loved, even more loved than I could ever hope for. We see that in the cross of Jesus, that cross, in which he took the place of who I really am, And we see that in a resurrection in which his love and power are all made available to me, the guy who doesn't want to be honest and who's cupping his heart. In Hebrews, it says it like this. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. Can you imagine Can you imagine that the you that I've been talking about tonight and the me I've been talking about tonight, this Mark Beebe who stood right in front of a church for it seemed like years and told them anything but the truth about what was going on in my life and what was going on with my family? Can you believe that the you that would lie right to God if you had a chance to? Can you believe the you that tonight is on the run from God that believes that God has defeated you, that's actually angry at God, but you're not not going to say that because, you know, good Southern Christians don't ever pray in such a way that we would tell God the truth about our feelings, especially if we're angry, because we would rather lie to God than say, this is my heart, God. This is why you and I are apart. This is why I'm on the run from you. This is what I think you did to me. We don't even give God a chance to actually speak the truth into us, amen, because we'll run before he can talk. We're so afraid to go, yeah, I want to start praying. I mean, I remember when I started praying again. I know what it was like, and baby, I let it all out there. I told God, you don't understand what you did to me. You don't understand what you did to my mom. You don't understand what you did to my family. You've broken me forever. I'm never going to be okay, God. i got to live with this the rest of my life. And God was like, well, thank you for that. I'd I'd like to share with you my heart. And God had to convince me of his loving me all over again like it had never happened in my life. All over again from the start. 
And he showed his whole heart to me. And he made it impossible for me to believe any longer that circumstances and his love for me were the same. Because they're obviously not. And Jesus is saying, I'm gonna make my father your father. We're that much family. We share that much of, of who we are together. That is why Jesus is not afraid to, afraid to call or ashamed to call you his brother or sister. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I'll praise you among your assembled people. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood. The son, also Jesus, became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. If God was gonna speak out of his heart to you and wanted you to speak out of his heart to them, which is where real sobriety and where real healing occurs, it was necessary for Jesus to come and suffer and struggle and experience the exact same emotions and the exact same defeats and the exact same disappointments and the exact same fears that we all do every day. It had to be like that. He had to not only know us and know of us, but he had to live exactly the way that we do. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. And I gotta tell you, you don't have to live in that hell anymore. You don't have to live in that bondage in those shackles anymore. You don't have to live in that fear of, you know what, I gotta be alone because nobody's really gonna understand how angry I am how sad I am, how afraid I am, how lost I am, how much I've lost someone that I really loved and how hard it is for me to get up every day and feel that, how hard it is for me to not wanna just go, I don't wanna do this anymore. We don't wanna say that because you know what? Somebody might break in to the hell and his name would be Jesus and he might drag us out of there and we might be free. After a while of pain, it's kind of like we sit in a pot of water and we're not even aware that we're slowly dying. But tonight, I want to make sure you're aware. We're going to receive the Lord's Supper in a minute. We're going to offer baptism. You can get baptized if you like and come and take communion or do it either way. It doesn't matter to me. But man, I hope you will not leave this room believing that you are not loved and believing that this is not a place where you can tell people the truth and believing that Jesus can't handle the brokenness inside of you. Sweet Jesus, I pray for this room. And I pray for people just like me who thought never ever will, will I ever be able to talk about Stuff like this. So come and free us. In your sweet name, amen.